This man knows exactly what he's doing. The Wrestling Life. Hey everyone, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 331. We're on the road to WrestleMania. And I'm Ethan. Welcome, Crab fans. I'm Liam. <laughs> Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. So what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Guys, CM Punk is spilling the tea. That's right. He's not mad, though. <laughs> He's not mad. Don't print in the newspaper that he got mad. <laughs> so Thursday, we're, we're about to record this show. And uh, everything starts getting real messy. Uh, <laughs> someone... Uh, on his subscription website, behind the paywall, there is a message board where Dave Meltzer chooses to um, reveal about 50% of the news scoops that he gets <laughs> rather than print them in his subscription newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so let's just start here with this CM Punk stuff because CM Punk is mad at Dave. He's mad at Jericho. And he's tangentially mad at Tony Khan. And... Uh, yeah, it's juicy. There's hot gossip here. Absolutely. It's uh it's yeah, every time, every time we think the story has ceased, we have no more discourse left to have. Phil blesses us with with another little nugget to keep us going. So here's Dave Meltzer's statement. Do you know and I quote, Do you know why they didn't advertise punk versus Moxley long? and why it had a short build. So this is before the late August, early September pay-per-view of last year. Mm -hmm. All out. Because Punk agreed to it, then AEW got a legal letter saying he wasn't down with it and wasn't doing it. And I, they didn't know if he'd come until Tony put his foot down. There are a lot of nice things I can say about him, and you can absolutely argue his position on Moxley was correct. But you can't argue he willingly did what he was asked in that scenario. So this paints a picture. This paints a picture of CM Punk being asked to do something with Moxley. Green to do that. And then AEW getting a legal letter saying CM Punk would not agree to, to that. That's the picture that that paints. Mm -hmm. CM Punk responds on his Instagram story. And I quote, sigh. <laughs> I wasn't cleared to come back to wrestle yet. Then plan was to wrestle at the pay-per-view. I sat and listened to Moxley's Rocky three idea. I explained how I'd never seen a Rocky movie. I and thought the idea sucked, but if the boss wanted to do it, whatever. He, being Moxley, said he wouldn't lose to me. <laughs> I'd <laughs> never experienced someone refusing to lose to me. I just laughed. <laughs> I asked Tony if this was what he wanted. He said yes. He's the boss, so I said okay, but I'd need to be cleared first. They kept saying it could just be a squash, so I didn't need to be cleared. I scoffed at that. My health is more important. Dave Meltzer is a liar. Jericho is a liar and a stooge. <laughs> there were plans, but plans always change. But I'll never put a company above my health ever again. Well, <laughs> Chris Jericho responded to this with, the Matt Hardy delete gif on his Insta story. Mm -hmm. These are 43 and 53 year old men. <laughs> Specifically, he posted that after uh, Punk deleted his story. So he's, ah, he's being very then, pithy. I see. And then Punk posted a I'm too old for this shit photo. 
mm-hmm. on his Instagram story. So we're relitigating CM Punk John Moxley's feud from seven months ago because uh, Dave Meltzer put out some information saying that CM Punk had sent AEW a legal letter and had would not do a job for John Moxley. Anyway, we saw how all this played out. CM Punk did a job for Moxley in a squash, then came back uh, a week and a half later and won the title. Mm-hmm. 20-minute match. And then uh, it tore his tricep in the match. And uh, and then uh, <laughs> got in a fight in the locker room after. And uh, we haven't seen him since. That is accurate. Uh, yeah, so some some highlights that I pulled from that. Uh, given that I don't believe that uh, that Mr. Brooks has ever publicly disputed that uh, he told the hangman that he would never, ever lose to him <laughs> after their uh, their little tiff uh, in May before Punk got hurt the first time. I thought it was very I thought it was very funny that Punk decided to throw a nugget in about Moxley refusing to lose to him. And sure. far and far be it for me to try to get inside the psyche of one John Moxley. But perhaps in light of CM Punk refusing to lose to one of the top guys in the company previously, perhaps Moxley took it upon himself as a quote unquote rock locker room leader and said, I ain't letting this guy waltz back in and beat me unless I know he'll do business first. I'm not saying Moxley is right. I think at the time we both said it was really stupid to have Punk lose in a two minute squash just to come back and do the rematch a week later. I agree with CM Punk that it was a really stupid idea (laughs) to do that. However, if I had to guess the why and why it became a pressing matter that Punk needed to lose to Moxley first, you know, I think. I think there might be, you know, there might be a pretty obvious reason as to why another top guy in AEW maybe wanted to uh, to test him on his willingness to uh, to put another guy over before agreeing to put him over. Does that make sense? It does. This is all guesswork. Of but course, of course. That that's as good. That's. That's a pro Moxley way of looking at this. Sure. It's a pro truth way of looking at this, perhaps. <laughs> um uh CM Punk does not deny that he sent a legal letter to mm-hmm. <laughs> to AEW saying that he wouldn't do that match. His reason for it seems pretty important. His reason being he was not medically cleared to wrestle. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And here's what we know about CM Punk. <laughs> His health is very important to him. Yes. <laughs> His health is incredibly important to him. He uh, he went nuclear on another company when they tried to F with his health. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this is messy. Uh, there's drama. We have uh, a lot of my favorite uh, players <laughs> when it comes to wrestling drama involved. We have CM Punk. Mm-hmm. We have Chris Jericho. Mm-hmm. We have uh, uh, Tony Khan and AEW. Uncle we have, Dave. We have Uncle Dave Meltzer, who uh, worked for his website for four years, and he has no idea I exist. <laughs> Sometimes he texts you squiggles while he's trying to send you uh, PWG notes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of players here. I I guess what I keep coming back to with CM Punk is uh, a quote from a movie I've never seen. Mm. Uh, that being the Big Lebowski. Uh, there's a quote at one point in the movie where John Goodman's character is he's yelling about something. And another character in the movie says to him, you're not wrong. You're just an ass. <laughs> and that has been my general opinion for a lot of Phil Brooks, various uh, 
feuds and beefs over the last, uh, you know, over, <laughs> over his entire career is I think there's a lot of things where you can go, Hey, assuming again, going on the punk. If you look at this from the pro punk side, as you said, I agree. He should not have been asked to do anything physical if he was not cleared. Absolutely. 1000%. I agree that the, uh, if the idea was, this was going to be a Rocky three thing. (laughs) Uh, I think it was stupid. Like as we said at the time, and as I will continue to say, it was really stupid that Moxley beat him clean in two minutes just to set up a rematch where punk won a week later. Like I am, I am 100% team punk on there. As I said at the original time, if punk, you know, if punk's assertions about hangman page, not listening to him and not wanting to take advice and, and the young bucks spreading lies about him, if any of that stuff is even half true, I think he's absolutely right to feel wronged and slighted and he's wrong and he's right to feel wronged and slighted by the company. If they were asking him to work while still injured work while not medically cleared, but (laughs) there is that other part where it's CM Punk and these things do seem to keep on happening to this gentleman. Don't they? (laughs) Yeah, they do. They do. (laughs) <laughs> there's there is a common denominator in all of these messy breakups <laughs> that CM Punk has had with wrestling promotions. Oh <laughs> uh, boy. Well, I don't know what if anything will come of this. Um I don't know. I I think people have been thinking uh, CM Punk is gonna come back to AEW at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think this helps that, <laughs> right? I don't think CM Punk wants to come back to AEW. I think CM Punk wants to make it look like he wants to come back to AEW so he can get paid out on his contract, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh, without, without actually working the rest of the contract. Uh, we don't know how long the contract was. Um. Yeah, <laughs> everyone involved is very litigious, <laughs> mm-hmm. which could make this even more fun. Uh, yeah. So that's a uh, that's a a rabbit trail on the road to WrestleMania. That's awesome. That's right. And I think really what we can boil this all down to is two simple words, and that's Phil's tired. <laughs> Phil's it's tired. Forty three years old, and he's tired. <laughs> That part is extremely relatable. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Sitting up there chopping on a muffin, yelling at all the assholes he's going to work with. Yeah. Very cathartic, I bet. Yep. Yep, that is tremendous. All right. Well, before we got sidetracked today, before we got uh, ambushed <laughs> by CM Punk, Chris Jericho, Dave Meltzer, Tony Khan, AEW, WWE is in the final build to their WrestleMania 39 show. Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns did a promo uh, on Monday Night Raw this week. Together, they were in the same building. Uh, It just happened infrequently Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on the build to Mania so far. We've got 12 matches announced for the two shows. Uh, What do you think so far at the build? I think the last couple of weeks have been pretty, uh, pretty strong. We didn't do a show last week, but uh, since we've last recorded, uh, well, actually, we probably would have missed it even if we had because it happened on Friday. Uh, but uh, they pulled the trigger on the reuniting of Sammy and Kevin, and it got a huge reaction. It felt like a really big moment. They solidified that match with the Usos, which feels like a really big deal. Um, yeah, I think I think that that, that stuff feels good. They introduced physicality to both uh, women's title programs, which I think was sorely needed in both. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. And then I think, I think this, this time the Cody Roman one-on-one promo was a lot more compelling and felt a lot more uh, intense than their first one. So I think they're, I think they're on the right track uh, as far as, uh, you know, 
eight, whatever we are, you know, nine or 10 days out from Mania at this point. So here are the matches. Roman Reigns versus Cody Rhodes. We touched on how they built, uh, the, how they built on that and uh, teasing dissension within the bloodline here. Um, teasing the idea that if Roman loses the title, that the Usos are going to turn on him and uh, that uh, Solo Sokoa could turn on him. Uh, they've kind of positioned Solo as the wild card of the group, the one that Roman can't quite control. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. It's not, I don't think I would do it, but it's interesting. I think it would be more compelling if I can't believe I'm saying this, but if Solo was like a foot taller, sure, he's a little fella. <laughs> <laughs> like he, I mean, he looks he looks the part. He looks like a big tough. He look he looks like a tough guy. But when he and Roman are having a stare down, or he's staring down with really anybody, like Kevin Owens is taller than him, and Kevin Owens is not a tall guy. <laughs> uh, so that's. I don't know. I I feel like his ceiling is not solo ceiling will not be a main event single star in this company, but maybe I'm wrong. Seth Rollins versus Logan Paul. Uh, we know that Roman and Cody is headlining night two. Mm-hmm. We suspect that one of the women's title matches will, ha- will headline night one. But the only other match that we know the night of Seth Rollins versus Logan Paul is taking place on night one. And they've done a couple of angles here with Logan Paul in person. Logan Paul has embraced being a heel, finally. Mm-hmm. And um, Seth got kind of got verbally gets over on him, but in at the end of the angles that, they, that they've done, Logan Paul has knocked Seth out both times. So it's a nice little story they're telling there. I I would like it more if Seth were mad about getting knocked out. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's a fair, fair. I would also like it more if Seth Rollins uh, wouldn't do this character anymore. But again, <laughs> it's like complaining about camera cuts. It's not getting fixed. It's just going to be part of the show. So <laughs> on we move. You don't like the singing, dancing, uh, sing song Seth Rollins that started as a heel and is now a beloved baby face. No, like I get it. Like sing along stuff. I've been I've long been a proponent of more sing along in wrestling, more audience participation is good. And if fans want to cheer him, then yeah, he should be a baby face, but he's still trying to be this like dime store, Jim Carrey Riddler character. Uh, sure. And it's just dreadful. I just, it just, it just grates on my soul. I hate it. Um, And if he was just regular baby face, Seth Rollins, I think, it would be a lot more compelling and also or be this wacky guy. But when it's time to get serious, get serious. Uh, That's also an option. If you, if you must do this, this thing that you're doing, you could at least, you know, make the angles matter by reacting to them the way a person would react to them by when they got punched in the face and embarrassed on, on national television. That's, that's fair. The Usos versus Kevin and Sammy. That's going to be great. People are ready for it. Our brother's got a hug. Everybody's excited about that. Mm -hmm. How do you Uh, feel about the top programs in both major U.S. wrestling companies being built around uh, 40-year-old men maybe (laughs) wanting to be friends or not be friends with each other? Uh, I like it in WWE, and I hate it in AEW. Okay. Okay. This is a common theme in my life. (laughs) Maybe because WWE knows how to shoot angles. Mm. Has people that have done angles on television for years. We'll touch on that later. <laughs> Utterly despised the AEW Dynamite show this week. <laughs> despised it. I watched it. All, I did watch the whole thing back. Ah. I despised it. Anyway. Uh, there's a men's WrestleMania showcase match to get everybody on the show. There's a four way tag team match. Sure, why not? Braun and Ricochet somehow become saddled with one another. <laughs> the Street Profits, who should probably sp- they should probably never split up, but they're probably splitting up sooner than later. That's fine. Like I get it. Montez kind of deserves a little singles run to see if he can do it. 
Um, Angela has been wrestling in uh, Natty and TJ's garage <laughs> and uh, has improved a lot. Maybe they should just like do some single stuff for a while, but not, you know, turn each other and throw each other through the barbershop window in case it does, this doesn't work out for either of them. Yeah, you could. I mean, we've seen with acts like the New Day and and act, you know, they you can have a guy break off into singles without breaking up the team or turning somebody heel. Like it is, it is possible to do that. Whether or not they will or not, we'll see. But yeah, I, uh, I don't feel strongly about Angelo Dawkins' chances as a singles guy. <laughs> Also in that four-way men's tag team match are the Alpha Academy, Chad Gable, and Otis, who they have teased joining the Maximum Male Models, which is made for some wonderful television. And the Viking Raiders are also in that match. Sure. The women's match, for some reason, I think they're doing qualifying matches on TV for it. And uh, Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez qualified for it so far. Three teams have still yet to qualify for that match. Mm-hmm. Uh, Edge is wrestling Finn Balor. Uh, Allen, so. Let me just say, I I would think that Chelsea and Carmella would be a team, but then Carmella just didn't show up to TV this week. Did we ever figure out why? We don't know. We don't know if she's hurt. Okay. Hope we she's don't all know. right. We don't know what the deal is. Yeah, she was pulled for uh, Dewdrop in that match. Um, could have just been they wanted to get Bianca uh, hitting the KOD on Dewdrop for like the mm-hmm. third straight Mania build. <laughs> <laughs> it's very impressive. Could 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 just be that your friend Adam Edge Copeland is wrestling Finn Balor in a Hell in a Cell match and did a spooky promo on Raw this week to sell the match. Let me just say, whatever I don't like to compare shows, as you sure. know. Oh yeah, and I will absolutely let you say your piece about what you didn't like about AEW <laughs> in a minute here. Thank you. But if you try to tell me a single thing on AEW television this week was worse than this Edge promo. I just don't know how to, I, I just, that is a road I can't follow you down. This was, he's a floating head and there's like three candles lit and yeah. he's doing a spooky promo about how he's the devil. Yeah. F off, man. <laughs> Not you. Ed, edge. Ed, edge can F off. All right. Um, They're going to do a hell in a cell. Whatever. Who cares? <laughs> it's going to be long and boring. Like all of Edge's matches. Finn's going to be the demon. And uh, Edge is going to be Edge. (laughs) Brood Edge. Great. Going to pour brown liquid that they will refuse to call blood on on Finn for some reason. Most of this Edge return has been a mess. I just, I just, like, at what point does does the bad stuff he's done in his career, bad stuff meaning bad <laughs> television work, begin to outweigh whatever positives? Like, when does that start to bring the average down on how we grade Edge as a professional wrestler? Because I, th- I feel like he was like a solid, like A minus maybe. And now he's like at a C plus for me <laughs> for his entire career. And it's all basically these last couple of years. Well, I think that's recency bias. And I think it's if you look at it, it's you're weighing three years of his at the end of his career versus 12 years of his prime or whatever. And it's like it's uh, real bad. <laughs> In my defense, it's very bad. <laughs> I haven't liked a lot of it. <laughs> I haven't liked a lot of it. He's still feuding with the Judgment Day. I I have no interest in seeing this match. <laughs> they started feuding like last June. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's a really bad feud. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I'll I'll definitely give you that. I think the promo was a matter of taste, and it was not my taste either. <laughs> I do not hate it worse than uh, famine and war, and Vladimir Putin invading the Ukraine the way that you do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll just have to agree to disagree on this. <laughs> sure. Uh, six woman tag, Trish Lee and Becky versus Damage Control. They've had about 30 seconds on <laughs> consecutive weeks to build this match. <laughs> it's, like, it's fine. It's an undercard women's tag team match. Uh, 
just if I had if I was flying Lita and Trish to TV every week, I'd maybe give him a little bit more in 30 seconds. But maybe, what do you maybe, let, him, maybe let him talk. <laughs> I mean, maybe not Lita, but like, I don't know, maybe let maybe let Becky cut a promo. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. That'd probably be an effective way to sell the match. Maybe just, you know, just spitball in here. Instead, this week they went comedy and had Becky dressed like Seth and uh, eating popcorn. Mm hmm. That's, you know, they just reasonable people can, you know, can disagree <laughs> reasonably. They went a different way. Sure. Austin Theory versus John Cena so far, which has consisted of John Cena verbally eviscerating Austin Theory in their mm-hmm. only promo and Theory uh, beating geeks on TV every week. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Theory's got to get one over on Cena at some point. Is I, Cena in for any more TVs? I don't know. I know he's filming another movie concurrently. So it doesn't seem that way, but I don't I don't know. I, w- I know they shot stuff in December that we have yet to see. When Cena was at, went to that SmackDown, I think okay. they, they shot some stuff for this. Uh, maybe that'll never see the light of day since Austin Theory has a beard now. <laughs> and for continuity reasons, maybe that won't see the light of day. I don't know. That would be dumb. <laughs> oh, boy. Less than stellar build to that match. <laughs> and I still think John should win, um, which maybe is why Austin should have uh, gotten some some leg up on John at some point. Instead, they'll probably do it the opposite way. Austin will win mm-hmm. and uh, and John will go home. Yep. Gunther versus Drew versus Sheamus in a triple threat match. Weak build to this, but the match should be great. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, it was either this or I mean, do a ladder match or something, right? We don't. Yeah, we don't need more of those. Well, I mean, unless you want to see Johnny Gargano and Mustafa Ali and I don't know, Dolph Ziggler added to the match. Sure. Sure. <laughs> well, we need somebody to wrestle on the Andre Battle Royal that's going to get pumped us back down again this year. I imagine. <laughs> Probably so. Brock Lesnar versus Omos, the real main event of the show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The colossal tussle. Yeah, they've done one angle. They screwed up the only spot they've done. <laughs> the crowd was chanting, holy shit. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, sometimes the old man is right about stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, Brock and Omos getting in the ring, and before they ever touched, the crowd chanting, holy shit. Uh, you could chalk one up to uh, Vince was right about this. Absolutely. And people were into, the matches were no good, but people were into him and Lashley, too, or almost in Lashley, too. So there is an attraction if you, if you <laughs> let this guy, you know. In the old days, he would come in, win a battle royal, and on Christmas night and then disappear for six months. Right. But now he has to be on TV every week. So he's not always being utilized perfectly, but you know, there's always a role for a giant on a wrestling show. Sure. Bianca Belair versus Asuka for the raw women's title. They had done a really weak build until this past week when they had, uh, they had him fight a little bit. And as you mentioned, that was probably overdue. And I think it helped. Yeah, I'm still not still not letting my world on fire, but world's better than Asuka playing keep away with the belt or whatever they've done previously. She uh, she burped up some some blue stuff mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, Bianca had to had to sell mm-hmm. <laughs> being confused about it or something. I'm not sure. Know. Charlotte versus Rhea Ripley in the uh, on the. You can reset the number of days since a woman has been barefoot in the ring on WWE television calendar <laughs> with, with Bruce Pritchard's face on it. Uh, Charlotte and Rhea had a, a great brawl on SmackDown. It was a really good angle. And uh, Charlotte had her shoes off. Mm-hmm. And uh, and uh, but I think it helped. I think it helped help this match also. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I liked the physicality as as we said, uh, very good, very good brawl. And uh, maybe as another way to enhance this, maybe Rhea's character could be a mute from now on. Maybe she don't talk so much no more. 
They give her a lot of dramatic monologues mm -hmm. to deliver. Mm -hmm. And hey, I'm not saying anyone else could deliver it better because, as you said, it's a lot of heavily scripted dialogue. But uh, hey, maybe maybe we don't let Rhea talk so much now. Maybe, you know, people hate Big Dom. Let Big Dom talk for her. Problem is, Rhea's feuding with Charlotte. Edge is feuding with Finn. Dominic is feuding with Ray. Mm-hmm. And so Rhea and Dominic are all over every show. And I don't think that helps either. They're they're in their own angles and they're in two other angles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All well, right. Well, that's the road to WrestleMania. Yeah. I like I said, overall, I think the last week or so, very good week of, of television. And I think you feel you feel better about all of the top matches than you did the week before. So thumb a thumb up for uh for the for the World Wrestling Federation this week. AEW had a dream match in the main event of their show this week, uh their dynamite show. It was Kenny Omega versus El Hio del Vikingo mm -hmm. in a match with a lot of flips. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was advertised as a match with a lot of flips and it delivered exactly what you would expect Kenny Omega versus Ohio Del Vikingo to. A lot of people really loved the match. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really entertaining. What did you think of it? I thought it was very good. Uh, I didn't. I don't think it's like a match of the year if. And maybe that's a disappointment for some for some people. Um, I thought it was a very good, fun TV main event. I'm uh, I think the most interesting thing to me is one, the timing of it just popping up here. It ended up being a backdrop to uh, an elite angle, your favorite. Um, also, post the Dragon Lee stuff, it seemed like maybe triple A. And AEW's uh, friendship was uh, a little rocky, but the you know Conan Conan's uh, at Dynamite this week with uh, with Vikingo and his like you know his his adopted daughter Taya Valkyrie is uh, is signed with the company now, so I guess I guess that's been smoothed out. Yep, and uh, that matters, uh, I guess. <laughs> Sure. I don't know. I just found, I just found it interesting that this happened at all because uh, it seemed like the the AAA connection was going away. So the fact that they let they brought in they allowed them to use their I mean not that they, not that anyone cares about the triple the mega championship, but they let him come in and just do a clean job. I thought was uh, was interesting and uh, it was a good match. So uh, a lot of discourse went into uh, how n not built up it was. Um, and then it ended up doing like the best numbers of anything on the show, uh, at least in the demo. So uh, nobody knows anything about anything, I think is what we found we found in the last few weeks. I think that I think that's probably fair. They. Um, yes. So the the. The world champion of AEW is Maxwell Jacob Friedman, who is. Feuding with four guys, three guys, three mm -hmm, guys, mm -hmm. feuding with three different guys. He's one of the four guys. They're they're not just four guys. They are the <laughs> four pillars. It's uh, they MJF kicked off his title. Reign continuing with Sammy Guevara, Darby Allen and the Jungle Boy. Mm -hmm. Doing a promo where they threw him in a cake. But they all said they want a title match. So we're getting those matches at some point somewhere down the road. But the world champion is uh, not on the show every week. And I'm not saying he needs to be, but it would help if he were around a little bit more. Or, you know, he had a program. I, I think that would help. He does have a program. It's with those three guys. I think they're going to do a four-way. Oh, that sounds terrible. It's the four pillars. That's the whole point. All right. I'm not saying you have to like it. I'm just saying that's that's the direction, clearly, I think, to me. I think you could say 
I think two of the three things in the statement you just made could be true. <laughs> it's like it, you could say that's the direction. You could say to me to say clearly. I don't think there's anything clear about anything on this program. <laughs> well, we're one week into it, though, right? Like two they weeks. Did the, they did the face off last week. This week we had they did the Derby match in the opener. After the match, they showed him looking up at the double or nothing sign, and then they cut to the video package of MJF ranting and raving about being thrown into a cake. And where were Sammy and Jungle? I guess they weren't on the show this week. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I don't feel like this is like I feel like there's a lot of stuff we could criticize about AEW's week to week storytelling, but I wouldn't put this on the list personally. I just think you're saying, well, it's clearly the next program. And it's like, it's clear as mud. <laughs> it's clear as mud. Well, I just think, okay, the four pillars were in the ring together. They're going to do a four away. That seemed very obvious to me. But again, that's just me. I swear. All right. So, okay. All right. If, uh, I will bet you one dollar that there is not a four way. Absolutely. All right. One dollar. Um, the show long angle was uh, are the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega and Hangman going to be friends again? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, you see, Hangman came out to save uh, Kenny Omega from the Blackpool Combat Club. Don Callis does not want Kenny Omega and Hanger and the Young Bucks to be friends again. And so he made it look like Hangman Page attacked him uh, when Hangman was just trying to save Kenny. And uh, and they're mad at each other about that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So Kenny Omega just needs to watch the show back <laughs> and see Don Callis take a fake bump when Kenny Omega lightly touched his wrist. <laughs> Right. And and this should all be squared away. You would think. Or you the only other option to make this make sense, because I do agree, it was a very any angle that is contingent on one of the guys involved not watching the show is dumb. <laughs> Unless, of course, it's Scott Steiner not realizing that the main event mafia had broken up and team. <laughs> that was great. Yes. No <laughs> one, no one but Scott Steiner could pull that gimmick off. Possibly modern Brock, who, as we know, <laughs> Paul told us he doesn't consume the product. <laughs> right. Okay. So two guys, Scott Snyder and Brock Lesnar, could pull this off. Yes. Kenny Omega cannot. So, uh, yes, there needs to be immediate follow up to your point about week to week storytelling. Needs to be, I would say, the first segment of next week's show should be <laughs> should be Omega and uh, Page in a segment because to me even if you go well he did shove him it's very clear that don took a bump which you could put down to poor execution of what the angle was supposed to look like (laughs) on on don Callis's part that's a possibility but based on the footage that we have unless it's going to turn out that kenny is evil again Right. right and is in on it with don and doesn't want to be friends with the bucks or hangman anymore yeah, which is fine. You could do that. Sure. Uh, then, yes, you you're going to have to do some very fancy editing to pretend that it wasn't like a 10 second delay from where Hangman shoved off Don Callis. And when Don Callis took a bump um, and then appeared to claim that Hangman had hit him with his big uh, his big wooden stick that he was carrying. Yes. So. There okay. are many there are many things I hated about this angle. Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. one was uh Hangman Page uh coming back to the building. So the Young Bucks get laid out at the start of the show and like out oh, the Blackpool Combat Club who are now dastardly heels, by mm-hmm. the way, which is fine. Like they, I don't I don't care if those guys are baby faces or heels, but it was kind of like a really sudden tone shift. Uh they're just they're just heels now. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh uh, the hanger went to the hospital with the young bucks, and then at the end of the show, Kenny's getting attacked. Hanger drives the ambulance back to the uh, to the building, 
fine. You know, it's 1999 WWF, but whatever. It's fine. And uh, and Hangman gets out of the gets out of the ambulance. And I think they shot this in real time because it took him <laughs> 12 minutes to get from the parking lot <laughs> to the ring to make the save. Mm-hmm. It's just like the timing of uh, uh and execution. Anytime they do an angle that is not just post match attack, bell ringing, here comes somebody out of the locker room to set up the next match. Anytime there's an angle that requires any execution beyond that, it's clunky, and I just I think it looks low rent. But okay. I don't, I don't disagree. I don't disagree that it was a bad angle. Like people seem to like AEW and I seem to be on another planet, which is okay. Well, like it's... I said, I don't, I don't think you're wrong to say that it was a, a clunkily produced angle, but I think the end is what people are thinking about. And the end in people's minds is something they want, which is hangman and the young bucks and Kenny to be friends again. Sure. Yes. Which I'm not saying excuses a bad <laughs> angle, because again, I agree this was not a good angle. All right. Okay. But All I think right. there are people that are being a little bit more forgiving of them, and there's still a little bit more of a a benefit of the doubt in AEW's audience. I th- I think that will not go away. I think it's been several years now, and that won't go away. So, I... I look, I I made my peace with this a long time ago. <laughs> this product is not for me. Sure. And that's fine. And there's still stuff on this show that I watch every week that I enjoy. I enjoyed Sting on the show this week. Mm-hmm. Sting teaming with Orange Cassidy and doing his spots, but then also doing his Sting spots and still being great at doing Sting spots at 64 years old. Mm-hmm. Like that. That's great. And Tony Khan. And I have a lot of differences, even though he's not aware. <laughs> he's not aware of me. Uh, we have a lot of differences. He's very uh, online. I bet he's read some of your stuff. I bet he has. Uh, but generally speaking, he doesn't know who I am. But uh, he has used Sting 100% perfectly since signing him. I have no problems with anything that Sting has been involved in. Mm-hmm. So good for him. And uh, they're having a Forbidden Door 2 in June in Toronto and uh everybody wants to go to that because uh tickets sold out pretty much right away. Everything they put on sale pretty much sold out right away. So uh they'll come out of double or nothing and go into uh a build for Forbidden Door, which had a lot of good matches on it last year. People seem to like it mm-hmm. and uh and people seem to be excited for it. So good for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited for that show. Uh, my only other note from, from Dynamite is uh, for like several weeks now, and I think we maybe even touched on this last time, Orange Cassidy is in like the second or third or sometimes first highest rated thing on the show for like yes. six straight weeks now. Well, it's usually because he's on in the first segment. But True, yes. although his, his and Jeff's match was at the top of the hour last week, and it still was the highest rated thing on the show so or highest rated thing in the demo so i'm just like do we do they value him the way they should i mean he's tony's favorite wrestler what how much more can he be valued should he be like the real champion instead of the AEW international championship (laughs) brought to you by shazam i think it's a discussion you could have I I like I, I don't have a problem with it. I think they always think of him and Jungle Boy and uh, and those guys as like, oh, we're building them for the future. But it's like at some point, you're four years into your company, mm-hmm. and the future's now. <laughs> and in Arch's case, he's like thirty six. Like he's a little bit older than all those other guys too. Like, sure. I don't know. I just like I, I mean, old, I, old man. <laughs> I don't know. I I just it's just something I've 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 been thinking about a lot lately. I'm like. Like, yeah, he's positioned well on the show. He wins all the time. So it's not as if you can say he's under pushed or underutilized on the show. But it's like, hmm, could could he or maybe this is the ceiling? Maybe like if they tried to push him to 
a tippy top spot, people would lose interest. I don't know. Like, it's just, it's just, I think it's an interesting thought experiment. It's one I don't disagree with you in that it's an interesting thought experiment. It's not one I'm interested in engaging in. <laughs> That's fair. I think if you want to push him higher, push him higher. If you want to keep him at this level forever, keep him at this level forever. I do think he's valued. I do think he has value. I think he's good. I don't want to engage with pretty much any Orange Cassidy discourse. <laughs> it's like I, I'm an agnostic on Orange Cassidy. Mm-hmm. It's like he's great in the ring. I don't think his character kills the business. I don't think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread either. It, I don't know. I'm I'm being overly negative about AEW when I don't need to be. You're an Ars Cassidy centrist, is what you're saying. Yes. I refuse to take a stand one way or the other. <laughs> All right. So AEW's doing that. Oh, uh, 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 a pervert booked the women's division this week when they booked Tony Storm against Sky Blue. Like, there's one reason you booked that match, and it's your pervert. <laughs> Sky Blue is on television a lot. <laughs> Clearly, she's their their Madison Rain, their head coach. She is their she is their number one project in trying to make uh, a, a a a women's wrestler from scratch with Sky Blue, and uh, I think it's mixed results. Yeah, but hey, they're doing house shows now, so maybe there's a chance for her to get better without having to wrestle on live TV so much. Sure, <laughs> sure. Did you see, uh, I think it was, Brit- was it Sky and Brit doing spots on that house show? Uh, I didn't see that, but that sounds sounds uh, like a bold strategy, but maybe something you would want to do on a house show. <laughs> it's definitely good that it happened on a house show. It was definitely, <laughs> it was definitely not good, but uh, it, it was about what you would expect. Ah, I see. So it bad. looks like it looks like someone had put it had uh slowed it slowed the video down, but it mm-hmm. was in full it was in full full motion. Fair enough. <laughs> Which is kind of how Brit is a fantastic character. Mm-hmm. Brit has always kind of wrestled in slow motion. Her her sling blade is probably technically exactly how you execute a sling blade. But it takes her 15 minutes longer to hit one sling blade than anyone else who hits a sling blade. It's just, it's Brit is what she is at this point. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's fine. Jamie Hader wasn't on the show because she had visa problems, apparently. So, well, that's that's not ideal. No, I thought everybody's visa situations had gotten uh, had gotten worked out, but perhaps not. Okay. Uh Sonata won the New Japan Cup. He's gonna wrestle Okada on April eighth, and uh they're going to do the spot where Sonata has <laughs> Okada in his submission finisher. Okada will appear to be close to passing out. The referee will not call the match. Sonata will then give up the hold, go up to the to the turnbuckle to try to hit a moonsault. He will miss it and he will lose the match because of it. <laughs> This is every Okada Sonata match we've ever seen. This is true, but an important detail uh, you you've neglected to mention is that uh, uh, he dyed his hair. Uh, Sonata has black hair now. He uh, he dyed his hair, and he has left the Naito group. He is no longer in uh, Lij. He has joined Taichi <laughs> and Doki and Kanemaru. And Takami Chinoku. All the stars. Sure. New Japan continues to not uh, light the world on fire with its booking or its uh, execution or its schedule. Um, <laughs> so they're, uh, they're running uh, the United States of America. They sold out Philadelphia uh, before they ever announced a match for it. And uh, the night before, they're in D.C. And they did not sell that show out. And tickets were not moving particularly fast for it. And um, the first three matches they announced for that show were all like undercard tag team matches. Mm-hmm. It was like, that's that's not what I would do. 
It's like Okada is going to be on that show because he is uh, on the poster for it. And like last year, Okada is going to work Saturday night in D.C. and then not Sunday in Philadelphia for some reason. I don't mm-hmm. understand. <laughs> but uh, I would maybe announce who Okada is going to be wrestling on that show if I wanted people to buy tickets to it. But they refuse to change the way they do business. And I should not get upset <laughs> about it. He, I mean, they didn't. He, he worked a tag last year at, at the DC show, right? Correct. So it's not even like you have to announce a title match ahead of the, you know, well, he's going to defend it against Sonata first or whatever. Like you could, you could just say that he's going to wrestle. Like as long as you pick four people who will still be under contracts <laughs> when the show is happening, yes. you can absolutely announce that match ahead of time if you do a tag match or even announce a singles match for him and just say, if he's the champion, then it'll be a title match. If he's not, it won't be. <laughs> yep. Yep. They seem, they seem to have a different strategy. So that's good for them. <laughs> All right. Well, I was uh, I nitpicked uh, Tony Khan to death on the show as I want to do. I uh, it's really not fair. It's really <laughs> not fair. Um, I feel bad about it, and I feel like uh, I feel like uh, Jim Cornette, which is not a good person to feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I'm more fair to the product than he is. I would agree. Um, and there are things on that less like, racist towards the product. <laughs> <laughs> There's also that. I think Rio's a good pro wrestler, mm-hmm. and uh, I uh, I do think he is to blame for her not being on Twitter anymore. Yeah. Uh, but hey. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where this is. Also, I would just say, uh, I don't think you have to feel bad uh, about being mean to Tony Khan, because he has a billion dollars, and there's no way to be too mean to someone that has a billion dollars, in my opinion. All right. Well, I'm not feeling better already. All right. Well, uh, until next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling. Bye. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. So uh, Nigel McGuinness is uh, performing in a in a magic show, uh, <laughs> WrestleMania week, which is certainly a a uh, certainly a new career. <laughs> so uh, he will be performing a show called Celebration: The Magic of Nigel McGuinness. At the Illusion Magic Lounge in Santa Monica, California. This is according to Wrestling Inc. The event is set to be one night only and will be B. McGinnis' first public magic show. <laughs> Weird way of wording that. But... I was going to say, that implies the existence of private magic shows. <laughs> yes. So, McGinnis left WWE in 2022. <laughs> he had been a commentator for years. The description of his upcoming magic show advertises, quote, after years of entertaining fans and friends with close up magic, (laughs) former Ring of Honor world champion Nigel McGuinness is finally taking their suggestion to do his own show. So the event is promising to be a fusion of stories about his career in pro wrestling through the medium of close up magic. That sounds fascinating. (laughs) Uh, Okay. (laughs) So tickets for the show are on sale. For thirty dollars, the event takes place next year. I suppose. Anyway. I hope that's like the minimum the venue will let you charge. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- the close-up magic stuff is interesting because it's like it's uh, it, you know, those those are those are I I do have a lot of respect for those performers. Mm-hmm. It's it's inc- it's you got to be really good at that skill. Oh yeah. I've I've never been a fan of the people that are like they go to or like they see a, a magic trick and they're like magnet mirror like I yeah I, we all know it's not real man right <laughs> it's like yes. pro wrestling in that way it's like yeah we all know we all know yes. it's not mysticism <laughs> we all know he's not really making that disappear into thin air it's fine just let us enjoy it <laughs> yes.
Nigel McGuinness probably 10, 12 years ago when he first uh, he left TNA, his career was over. He had somehow contracted hepatitis. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was always unclear to me whether like that. I don't know if people wouldn't book him because he had hep- hepatitis or if he did not want to take bookings because anyway, regardless, his pro wrestling career was was ending. And uh, he had shot this documentary about the last days of his career. And um, he'd done an interview promoting it. And I thought he came off very well in the interview. And uh, I followed him on Facebook at the time, or I liked his fan page on Facebook or mm-hmm. whatever the deal was. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'm going to start writing blogs about uh, transitioning to a new career as I try to f- figure out like what to do with the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, that's kind of compelling. And he seems like a nice chap. And uh <laughs> He would write the, like this weekly blog. And I think he was living in Los Angeles at the time. And like the first four were like, OK, you know, I um, I had a voiceover uh, audition today. Um, I'm s- still kind of struggling to make ends meet working odd jobs. But uh, this voiceover audition went really well. And I feel good about that. And then like week two it was like, OK, well, yep. still uh, still going to auditions. Uh, got some, uh, got some side work doing this and, uh, and, uh, week three, same thing. Week four, same thing. Mm-hmm. Week five, the mm-hmm. week five, the blog begins with, let me tell you about the benefits of the polyamorous lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> what the, whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> And then, like, from then on, all he did was write about how he likes to ha- take many lovers. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right man well look i'm not judging you I, this just isn't for me anymore <laughs> i was gonna say it's not exactly what was advertised <laughs> no in those media appearances <laughs> no 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 <laughs> you did not tell brian alvarez he was going to be starting a blog about his <laughs> about the benefits of the <laughs> lifestyle <laughs> No, no, you didn't. <laughs> well, then too, it's like, well, everyone, including yourself, assumed that you had gotten hepatitis by bleeding in a wrestling match somewhere in a dirty environment. And mm-hmm. it's like, well, now we have a lot more questions about how you may have contracted hepatitis, don't we, Nigel? That's right. Anyway. <sighs> Nigel McGuinness. Nigel McGuinness says close up magic show. <laughs> close up magic. And you know what the most magic, <laughs> the most magical thing of all about Nigel McGuinness? It's his polyamorous lifestyle. <laughs> what? Why did you spring this on us all? <laughs> After week four? Like, why couldn't. Ugh. I just like the idea of him being like, is this the week? It's the week? Can I do it yet? <laughs> <laughs> Can I start writing about this yet? This is a Trojan horse. <laughs> it's like he was doing a pyramid scheme for polyamorous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he did a Trojan horse for pol- for the polyamorous lifestyle. <laughs> I'm going to get in talking about wrestling and my struggling, uh, you know, trying to start an acting career or whatever, or a mm-hmm. voiceover actor career. And then, then... I shall pounce. <laughs> the time is right. <laughs> I will strike. I will recruit people to the polyamorous lifestyle. <laughs> On a lighter note. Yes. I have had a phrase buzzing around inside my head for uh, weeks now. You tell. Um, every day when I'm driving home uh, from, from work, uh, the, the one of the lights I stop at on Bel Air Road, there's a seafood restaurant uh, and their sign says, and I quote, welcome crab fans. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think I'm going to start working that into our show. Beautiful. <laughs> I just think that's a very, uh, I don't know. I started hearing it. Like the more it's just one of those things where you stare at it 
when you're sitting at a light for like five minutes yes. and you're like, and it just sounds more ridiculous the more <laughs> times you mumble it to yourself. Yes. And then, and then in my case, I began to sort of imagine it as like a, a YouTube sign on for like a, I don't know, a crab fisherman YouTube channel. Yes. Welcome What's crab up? fans. What's up crab fans. So I think I'm going to start uh, addressing uh, the listener as crab fans from here on out. That sounds good. Oh, boy. Uh, Kind of similarly, not kind of similar. (laughs) On the way to your house, there is a uh, a uh, ladies hair salon called the Panache Hair Studio. Mm hmm. That uh, Anna and I always intentionally misread as the pancake hair studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would that be? It's like, oh, your hair looks so fluffy. <laughs> Let's just finish you off with some maple syrup, <laughs> dash of powdered sugar. Ooh, so light and fluffy. Your hair looks wonderful. What is that? Is that cinnamon? <laughs> Did you add a pinch of cinnamon to the... Hmm, chocolate chips. <laughs> hair is so light and fluffy and buttery. <laughs> the Pancake Hair Studio. Yeah, I love it. All right. Welcome, Crab Fans, I think is better, but I enjoyed <laughs> the Pancake Hair Studio. <laughs> I agree. Both good. It's not a competition. Thank you. <laughs> I try to keep on keeping on.